Not since the 1920s has Britain been so socially unequal. Birth, not worth, has become more and more a key determinant of people's life chances. That trend is getting worse. We've gone back to a society that's economically as divided as an upstairs, downstairs, post-World War I society. You're less likely to be able to change your position and then your children's position than your parents or your grandparents were. As the gap between the rich and the rest has widened, so has the gap in opportunity for their children. Part of the problem for working class young people is they talk about the professions being for posh people. Which side of the line are you on? Are you struggling to break into the professions? Or are you using your money and contacts to give your children a leg up? Parents are actually trading internships amongst themselves now. You have my daughter for two weeks in your law firm, and I'll take your son for two weeks in my bank. I'll be looking at the barriers that stop people rising up the economic ladder, the unseen advantages that the affluent pass on to their kids, and the basics like contacts and work experience that effectively rule some people in and most of us out. I'll be asking, who gets all the best jobs? I come from working class roots, but I got a degree and became a BBC reporter. I thought this was a country where ability was the main qualification. Evidence suggests I was wrong. Success, it seems, is more about money and contacts, and the top jobs are still for a select few. Only 7% of kids go to private schools, but three in four of our judges are privately educated. One in two of our senior civil servants, privately educated. One in three of our politicians, privately educated. Two in three of members of the House of Lords, privately educated. And guess what? It's getting worse. Britain's top jobs are certainly worth having. The average hospital consultant earns about £130,000 a year. A senior barrister can expect to be on more than half a million. The boss of one of Britain's top 200 companies would expect to take home more than a million pounds a year. So the big earners are pulling away from the rest of us. And the more money they have, the more they're able to buy advantage for themselves and their children. For a start, getting into a top job nowadays often means working for nothing. I'm actually living in my parents' flat. Luckily for me, my parents are somewhat older and uh, my father's semi-retired, so they spend most of their time in the country and I get the run of the flat, which is very nice. <laughs> Antonia's daily commute is a three-mile trip from Chelsea to Soho in London. She works as an unpaid intern at Modus, a top PR company for the fashion industry. 70 people work here, up to 20 of them are interns. They usually work for three months and most are unpaid. Right now, they're preparing for London Fashion Week. Antonia has a master's degree in English, but to make it in fashion, you have to start at the bottom. You have to be known by the companies to get a job. And I know that I can't just leap straight into a job, and actually this is very good for me. The interns do most of the basic work. Every little girl dreams of being in fashion, but you get into it and you realise that there's so much more behind the scenes, you know, cleaning the floor and cleaning up after events. It's sort of a nothing position. You need help in every way, whether it's financial or sort of moral, just to get through it. Sarah worked as an intern for 15 months. She was lucky. For most of it, she was paid. And at the end of it, she got a job. Who is she? Do we care? She's block of freelance. It almost is a prerequisite for any professional position that you want. So if you can get in with a company like Modus, and work your way up there, you're golden. Sarah, Sarah got her job before the recession hit. Loads of celebrity coverage, isn't there? It's good. Since then, the competition's got even stiffer. There are so many applications coming in every day, so many people that are so forthcoming and working for free. You sort of have to look at that and say, well, you know, do we want to throw money at them if, if, if they're willing to do the job anyway? And I think um, 
The answer is no. Eight a.m. on a damp Wednesday morning. It's London Fashion Week, and Modus are working on one of the biggest shows. And they're here in force, including half a dozen of their interns. If I just go briefly through G2, on the main front door is Tyler and Fiona. On the interior door is Harriet and Antonia. The ten minutes that the show's on, that's the most important thing. So all the work building up to it has to be precision, it has to be right, it has to be the right people in the right place at the right time. Morning everyone! Bright and breezy! Oh. Woo! A lovely light, yippee! Okay guys, it's a really lovely sunny morning show. The boss has arrived to oversee the operation. He believes internships offer newcomers a chance to get a foot in the door at one of the most competitive jobs in the business. Within the fashion industry, generally, the intern is is a you know is a really vital um, resource. Um, we need we just need we need so many people. And, and do the interns work? Do proper work when they're here? Absolutely, yeah, they they really do. And what we really try and do is um, is also get them to have a variety of um, of experience as well. If fifteen, more than fifteen, maybe twenty of your seventy staff yeah. are working here for free. Presumably that's quite key to the way you're profitable as well, is it? What do you mean in the sense that are we more profitable because we've got free, yeah, free because, staff? Yeah, as you just said, they're doing proper jobs yeah. and they're doing them for free. Well, I mean, I think when I say they're doing proper jobs, I mean they're doing, they're doing, um, they're doing support jobs to, to the, to the doing, key though. team. But they are, they are things that need doing, yeah. So, yeah. So, so does that help your company remain profitable? I think, I think that, um, I think that it's... Um, yeah, well, how, do, how would I answer that? I've never, really thought, I've never really thought of it like that. The interns at Modus get experience across different departments, but they can expect to work hard. I was up this morning at 5 o'clock. I came into work on the bus. I was here at about quarter past seven, putting out press releases, um, making sure that the seating was correct, uh, making sure everyone knew what their jobs were for the day. And uh, now it's my job to stand at the interior door and make sure that everyone knows where they're sitting. Really, this is an opportunity for me to make the contacts and to get in touch with the right people, to find another job. If you're prepared to put in the hard work, it pays off eventually. Uh, I'm wearing a little bit of Jaeger. Celebrities and excitement. Life as an intern in PR can be a glamorous business. But working for free is a luxury not everyone can afford. Rocks and stones. Broken Doesn't it depend on, on privilege and, and access to wealth and access to free accommodation to be able to work for free for three months? Most people can't do that. I do worry sometimes that it does favour um, the slightly slightly better off. Although we've had um, you know we've had again we've had a few interns who are then you know working evenings and, and doing sort of bar jobs to to really supplement or, or to give them an income. The problem is, one internship is seldom enough to secure a career. Of around 50 interns who work at Modus each year, only a handful get jobs there. I wouldn't mind if I had to do three or four three-month internships in a similar situation. If it got me the job of my dreams at the end, I would do it. It helps if you live in the South East. Almost two-thirds of Britain's top companies are now based in London. Internships now are the currency by which individuals can get into these prestigious jobs in the, in the professions that are running our country. And the way that you get those is by being able to work unpaid, usually work in London, not have your travel costs reimbursed. It's not just PR. My own profession, journalism, is getting harder to join. It used to be a job you could do straight from school. Now you mostly need a degree, and more journalism jobs than ever are in London. Girish Gupta from Wiltshire has a degree in physics from Manchester University, but set his sights on becoming a journalist. He did four separate internships, three at National Dailies, one with a top news agency, all unpaid, all in London. I stayed in hostels like this one for 16 quid a night. I stayed in random people's houses on Gumtree, which obviously cost a fair bit as well. 
very roughly, I mean, it would have cost over a couple of grand in, in all for all these placements for accommodation, not even including food, to be honest. He paid for it by doing a master's degree in physics, then used his student loan to fund his internships in the holidays. At first, it's the excitement of it all, so you're not too worried about the money because you presume that will come in the future. So uh, just seeing you know, your first page lead, your first byline in a national paper is a massive deal. So after a while of getting all these bylines, I, I started to realise that actually it was the newspapers that were making money out of me and making money out of my work and not paying for it. In all, the papers he worked for published 32 of Girish's articles. By the time of his last internship at The Independent, he was losing patience. I worked at The Independent earlier this year and in my time there I had about six articles published. And what I began to realise was that I was doing exactly the same job as the guy next to me, um, and he was obviously getting paid for it. Girish decided to take it up with the paper. He wrote asking to be paid a minimum wage for his shifts. I got a phone call from someone very high ranking, basically screaming at me and telling me that, uh, that I had no right to do that and had no right to, uh, to voice, voice that opinion. I did try and... Um, I, I, I offered to argue my case and he just wasn't up for it and he eventually slammed the phone down on me. The Independent told us that work experience is a useful way of getting your foot in the door and in the past people have got jobs off the back of it. They say in Girish's case that he was warned in advance that his work placement would be for just two weeks and that it would be unpaid. In the end, Girish ran out of money. For him, not living in London was too big a barrier. If getting a job involves working for free for months in Britain's costliest city, it is clearly not open to all. But that is just one of the barriers to getting a top job. There are plenty, and they don't just affect a poor minority, they affect most of us. Take medicine, a key job in any community. Medicine offers status and a good salary but it's a world closed off to many of us. More than half of top doctors working in Britain went to private school. And research shows the next generation of doctors are typically growing up in the richest 20% of families. Sarah Pierce has spent 20 years fighting for fairer access. The students largely come from independent schools, so there's been a an increase in those who come from the state comprehensive sector but it's still dominated by affluent people very often with doctors in their family or among their friends. So we just produce generation after generation of doctors from the same families? Yes, that's right. So people are cared for by rich people? Well not necessarily rich but they're not cared for by people like themselves, people that they can identify with. Medicine is the one profession where the balance of backgrounds ought to be easy to change because everybody who goes through medical school will get a job as a doctor. The problem is getting into medical school. If you could bring your knees up for me, please. Medical schools take in twice as many students from the wealthiest families as other courses, and only one in seven medical students comes from families in the lower half of the earning scale. So the epicondyls and the femur are sort of more, the scale more largely, yeah. What are you doing wrong? Where are you failing? Every medical school in the United Kingdom has widening participation, the widening access teams working in schools, working not simply in secondary schools, but actually going into primary schools. If they're all doing so much, why is so little changing? I think we are all challenged by that. and We are all disappointed because of the work we're doing. It does take time to change, and actually if you look at the figures, there is some change. But there are still some pretty basic barriers facing candidates from poorer backgrounds, like having enough cash for the five years of medical school and getting hands-on knowledge of a life in medicine somewhere along the line they're expected to get work experience but it's much easier to get work experience for medicine if you know somebody a doctor who will supervise you and many of them don't if they come from poor backgrounds they're most unlikely to know a doctor in the hospital who will supervise them so that's how it works in practice that's how it works in practice the medical profession has no single nationwide policy on how to get work experience which doesn't exactly help the less well connected 
if you have good personal contacts, you will have an advantage over those who don't. But one of the reasons we work in our local community and beyond our local community is in exactly that, to get a better understanding and to enable students applying to get the experience. I have come across scores of students who have been in touch with me and they have written perhaps to half a dozen hospitals trying to get work experience and very often their letters haven't been answered. If medicine has a long way to go, then it's only part of a pattern repeated across the traditional professions. Lawyers administer justice for us all, but the profession is hardly representative of the wider community. Seven in ten judges and six in ten barristers went to independent schools. I accept that the public perception of barristers is of a privileged profession who are drawn um, from a small section of society. I think that's absolutely right. When I chaired the bar, the choice of new barristers was made by small sets of chambers who weren't trained in personnel procedures and in good diversity practice. And I thought a lot of um, access problems needed to be addressed. So in 2007, the Bar Council, the barristers' governing body, commissioned a report to look at how to make joining the profession fairer. And this is it, the Newberger Report, and it had 57 recommendations. And its key points were broadening access and improving recruitment, because those are the areas they accept they were getting wrong. This is the Bar Council's Equality Committee. For its members, the challenge is how to achieve that wider access without compromising standards. We only interview people who have got a 2-1 or above. And that's a commercial decision because we'd be interviewing forever if we didn't have that criteria. When you come from a background where nobody has been to university, where the best that people have achieved is possibly staying on for their A-levels, to do A-levels is a heck of achievement for somebody like that. I'm not entirely sure it's fair to sit there and say, I'm going to hold it against you just because ostensibly on paper you did go to Oxbridge or to a public school. If someone's been to a, a, a lousy bog standard comp, they've obviously had to have been a, a great deal better to get into a, a particular university than someone who's been to a, a very privileged public school where success is the norm. Barristers now get training to avoid favouring candidates better placed to tick all the boxes and more than a thousand barristers now go into state schools each year to demystify the profession for students. But changing the profile of a profession takes time. This is the Young Barristers annual gathering. Look around and you can see the bar has recruited more women and more ethnic minorities. But the social barriers remain. I went to a very modest fee-paying school in, in Norfolk. I grew up in Norfolk. Um, then I went, to, I went to Oxford to read English. My dad was a barrister. Um, I used to travel to court with him, and so became interested from, from that stage. It's really funny. I seem to have weeks where I do just prosecution and weeks where I do just defence. I went to school in Forest Gate, which is in Newham. I then went to Walthamstow to Sixth Form College and to Queen Mary University. In terms of how typical I am, whilst there are people with a background like mine, it's relatively unusual. Money is one of the biggest barriers to widening access. It costs £15,000 to study for bar exams on top of a degree. The higher those costs become, the higher that barrier is and the bigger the loans end up being. Um, and that, in my opinion, is the single biggest thing which prevents people accessing the bar. So it seems to get a top job, you increasingly need to be well off, have good contacts and be able to work for free. And that's not many of us. We've now got a position where tomorrow's professional is growing up in a family that is richer on average than seven in ten families in our country. That means that some middle class kids, as well as working class kids, are being denied opportunities that should be open to them. The former Labour Health Secretary, Alan Milburn, is a dedicated champion of fair access to the professions. His report, Unleashing Aspiration, compiled for Labour, looked at how we might improve the situation. And then the coalition government surprised the political world 
by appointing him as its social mobility czar. You're now part of a new government. <laughs> you, ah, he said you, seamlessly. <laughs> yeah, you were in one and now you're in another one. Why on earth did you sign up with um, the coalition? I'm very surprised that the government has agreed to it because everybody knows my views. Those views on social mobility were formed by Milburn's childhood in the North East. Well, this is where I grew up as a teenager um, at the end of the 60s, early 70s, so it's got lots of memories. His journey from Newcastle Backstreet to high political office was made during the golden age of social mobility. When we moved here, it was a very run-down area. Oh, it wasn't, wasn't a glamorous place to grow up. Oh, this, is this, is, this is actually where I grew up, yes. It's what's known as a Tyneside flat, so we lived upstairs. What made you become what you are from this street? In an area like this, there was you know, lots of poverty and all that stuff. What you didn't have, I don't think, is two separate worlds. You didn't have one society here, mainstream, and another society separated from the rest. And so there was a way of being able to get out. So for me, it never felt like you couldn't make your way in the world. It didn't mean working your way to the top but you could become part of the mainstream. So in those places there was a sense of a ladder. You might be on the bottom rung, but there was a ladder. There was definitely a ladder. Back then, O-levels were usually enough to get you into an office job on the bottom rung. And after that, anything was possible. Morning. Can I help you? People left school at 15, 16 and got work. There were jobs in banks and so on. There was a whole range of things you could do. A small number of people went to university, but that's gone. When Alan Milburn was a young man, Newcastle was an industrial powerhouse. Swan Hunter alone employed over 12,000 at shipyards. But in the 80s, Britain's manufacturing industries disintegrated. Well, this is the home of shipbuilding in the heart of Newcastle. And I suppose when I was growing up as a kid, if you didn't have an education qualification, mm. nonetheless, these sort of jobs provided you with an opportunity to get on the employment ladder. So if you didn't go the academic route... You if you didn't go the academic route, you could get a job here. Yeah. Now look at it, it's all disappeared. I think the great thing about a place like Swan Hunters was you could start at the bottom, serve your apprenticeship, learn your trade, do your time, and move on up and stay there for life. But if they're good at their job now, won't they rise through as they would have done here 20, 30 years ago? Nowadays, the gap between the people who go down the so-called vocational route and the people who go down the qualification route is so vast. So you've got a segregated labour market divided between the haves who've got a qualification and the have-nots. Our party is the party of equality of opportunity. <laughs> The 80s saw an hourglass economy emerging, with unskilled workers trapped at the bottom, rich pickings at the top, and a collapsing ladder between the two. In five years' time, I'll have made a fortune, and that's what I want. The number of people out of work has gone up sharply to a new record level. More than 3,340,000 people are on the dole. It was a key moment, a fork in the road. Those with good jobs could provide more for their families. The rest were left behind. In the 80s, the gap between rich and poor widened by 60%. That's the largest increase on record. And economic inequalities, large differences between the rich and the poor, work against social mobility. The social distance between those at the bottom and the top is far too great. It's like a chasm between people. These 1950s babies were born into the golden age of social mobility. If you were born to an average family in 1958, you were more likely to get a job in the professions when you grew up than if you arrived in the world just 12 years later, in 1970. That steady decline has continued to this day.
But not everyone blames external forces. Some believe the economic divide has far less impact on where we end up than raw natural intelligence. My basic argument on the basis of the evidence that I've looked at is that if you're bright and motivated, if you work hard, uh, then you will be to a large extent successful, almost irrespective of what kind of family you came from. In this country, the top jobs seem to be dominated by those people who've been to private school. Well, why is that? <laughs> Because of the ability distribution. So, so people there the is an ability the... distribution across the social classes. There are, there's less ability at the bottom of the social classes. On average, you will find the ability level of the children being born into middle class homes is higher. And that is what's driving the difference in occupational outcomes between the classes. A lot of people are going to find that very hard to stomach. Yeah, and they're going to, them. yeah they're, going, they're, going, they're, they're going to find it absolutely obnoxious. But, but it's this genetic element that somehow those people at the bottom of our society produced offspring that are not capable of rising to the top. No, many, I, I many, don't think that's the case. Many, many, many people uh, in the lower uh, positions in the society produce children who are bright, and those children rise. But on average, you will find the ability level of the children being born into middle class homes is higher. And that is what's driving the difference in mobility outcomes. If the children of the rich are cleverer, then surely poor children will struggle to climb up the career ladder in every society. But not all countries are like this one. Amongst developed countries, we have one of the poorest levels of social mobility. The latest research suggests that here in Britain, only about half of your earning power is down to your effort. The other half is down to the start you get in life. Now, in other countries where the gap between rich and poor is narrower, then things are different. There, about 20% of your income is down to your background, 80% is down to your effort. It's no coincidence that the societies that are most mobile, some of the Scandinavian societies or countries like Australia, they're more mobile because they're more equal. So fairness and aspiration, these two things actually go together. Over 15 years of doing research with working class young people and families, there's not a dearth of aspiration. That's not the problem. It's having adequate resources and knowledge to put those aspirations into practice to be able to realise them. Carmarthenshire in South Wales. A reunion of Flandilo Grammar School's class of 61. All clever baby boomers who passed their 11 plus. I came to Sandilo and I thought I was a bee's knees and I think I found my feet after then. I just found the confidence uh, which I lacked. If eh? <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> well too, well fantastic. If I hadn't gone to the grammar school, I don't think the expectation, maybe my mindset, maybe the opportunities, there's a whole number of things that might not have been there that in the grammar school, I just took as red, really. Grammar schools had a massive impact on our nation's social makeup. In post war Britain, they scooped up the brightest children and moved them on up. The world was your oyster. Going to the grammar school, that was your pathway to achieving and to a successful career. It wasn't just about facts and lessons. Grammar school children were encouraged to believe in themselves. I did an honours degree in geology and um, then I went on to do a master's degree in ecology. I graduated from the Royal College of Music in Manchester. I went straight on to Glyndebourne and uh, that was the start of my operatic career. <laughs> These were the lucky ones, but there was a downside. For every 11-year-old that got into grammar school, three others were rejected. Selection so young was pretty brutal. Now, the comprehensives that replaced them were intended to give all children the belief that they could flourish, but did they? What makes me, I suppose, sad and angry in equal measure is what I call the not for likes of me syndrome, where I talk to groups of kids and they say, well, 
maybe I could become a doctor, but that's not really for the likes of me. Or maybe I could become a journalist, but that's not really for the likes of me. Alan Milburn's home territory, the North East, has the lowest proportion of graduates in Britain. He believes a lot of young people here set their sights low because they have no experience of people reaching the professions. What ideally would you all like to do when you left school? Well, acting. What, what about the rest of you? Same. You all want to be actors? Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's possible for somebody from around here, from a very ordinary type of background, do you think it's possible for somebody to get to the top? Yeah. You do? You're optimistic about it? Yeah. Cheryl called it. Cheryl called? <laughs> yeah. If you've got the ability, it doesn't matter where you live. What's the hardest thing? What stands in the way of people? It's the people thinking, well, because you're from that area, then you're not as good as someone from that area. So you just have to get past those stereotypes and then you can do anything. Have you all had careers advice or not yet? Have you had? Yeah. And what was that like? <laughs> was it? Yeah. Was it not very good? No. So did anybody ever discuss with you going into like a professional job? You know, like becoming a journalist, uh, a medicine, the law, accountancy, uh, architecture? Nobody ever discussed that with you. And what do you think about those sort of professions? You know that lawyers get a lot of money and stuff, but you, you know that they, they argue in court and stuff, but you don't know that much about it. You don't know that like, the things that actually make lawyers want to be lawyers. If you don't know much about it, you can't really, you, don't, you can't express an interest in it. You're asking a hell of a lot of children if you want to say, please have very high aspirations, because if the children have got any sense, they realise that their chances are incredibly low. Um, and so, in effect, only very misguided children will think, I can become a pop star, I can become a top footballer, I can become a barrister. Most parents do want the best for their kids, but some can provide more support than others. Look, I'm not bothered about people having sharp elbows and strong voices. Some people have that and some people don't. And actually, what we want, if you like, is more people with middle-class attitudes trying to do the best for their kids, absolutely. But some people just don't have those opportunities. There's an enormous amount of middle-class family labour and money and effort that goes into making up the middle-class child as artistic, musical, cultured and all these accomplishments really count in their favour when they're applying for jobs and moving into the labour market. Miranda is um, our driven child out of the four children that we have. She's good at maths, she's good at English, she's good at just about anything. She is very modest actually, she's not pushy, she's not a show-off, she's just one of those kids that she knows what she wants and she'll get it. About four years ago, she said she wanted to be a heart surgeon. Today, Miranda is starting a new school, the private Kings in Gloucester. Although her three siblings all go to state schools, Miranda's parents have decided an independent school will suit her better. What is it that, 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 will, that you want Miranda to be like, the things that will make her as a person, after she's completed her schooling here? What I want her to be like is, is like me at the age that I am now. It's taken this long to get to be confident and be able to talk to anyone. I think um, she, she's got it in her. She's reasonably shy at times, but she's got it in her to have those interpersonal skills. The fees at King's Cathedral School are £12,000 a year. That's middle of the range for a private education. What do you get for your money? What does a parent get for their money? Oh, where do I begin? I mean, you get a first-rate academic education. 
uh, with every chance of gaining top, top A-level grades and getting in, in most cases, to the university of your choice. But there's so much more. I mean, the extracurricular program here is vast, and definitely the kids have that shine of confidence about them when they leave the school. You can see that very, very clearly. I very much hope that you had a good holiday. It was, of course, a very busy holidays for some. And at this point, I'd just like to mention the sporting tour of the Barbados. It seems to have gone extremely well, very much a job well done. You've got five children here now. Yeah. Uh, you have eight children. I know. Uh, that's an enormous amount of money. It's an investment. I mean, we give up lots of things to send our children here. We don't have the holidays that I would like. I don't have the nice car that I would like. I drive a bus. Um, and I think that this school in particular has that ability to make my children the sort of children I want them to be when they grow up into teenagers and adults. Do you have any guilt about paying a lot of money to, 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 to get your son a very lucky star, fortunate star? No, I'm just grateful I can, I guess. Um, I suppose we're paying twice because we're paying here and still paying in our taxes, but that's the way it is. One of my daughters wants to be a marine biologist, so she goes down to Southampton. One wants to go into space, so she's going to go in for Cambridge. Are you already thinking that this is a good school in terms of getting them into a profession? Is that one of the reasons that you... Yeah, definitely. If you give them a good start, they will flourish and they will maybe, hopefully, find out what they want to do quicker than I, you know, I did, really. More than 200 miles north in Darlington, Jordan Reed is about to start his new school, Longfield Secondary. His parents are proud he's a bright lad, but have firm views about how far his education should go. I don't want them to be going out and having to get um, loans and things to get through university and be in quite a lot of debt at the end of it. Um, it's not up to me. It's not a way to start a life once you, once you do get your job. It's it's just something a burden around your neck, really. Mm. So to go to university, from your point of view, is a kind of gamble. Yeah. When we do get through it, what experience have we got? Uh, none. We we'll start working at a job, learning as a train, and get experience at the same time. Bye. Have fun. Bye. 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 Jordan's going to the local comprehensive. I thought my mum would have been crying or something, like happy, proud crying or something like that. Yeah. Hi. 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 He's lucky because Longfield is an improving school. In the past five years, it has doubled the number of pupils it sends on to sixth form college to 80%. What is it that you do differently here to perhaps other state schools? At Longfield, we focus on the development of their life skills as well as their academic skills. Why? Why do you do that? Just because in the five years that they're here, it's really important to us that they leave with um, a, good, a good group of qualifications, but it's also important that we prepare them for their post-16 education, for when they go to college, when they go on to university, for the jobs that they may choose to, to select. These are the skills that employers look for, so it's, it's not just our job to look after them for five years, we have to look after them um, from when they leave Longfield as well. And then remember, you're recording all of your personal achievements. A child at this state school will have spent on their education, on average, a quarter of what is spent on the education of a child at a private school. So when there is this big gap in resources, how can a young person leaving this school expect to compete in the job market with a kid from a private school down the road? Of course, it would be wrong to suggest a bright child from a poor background can't enter the professions. But it can be a long and difficult journey. Georgina Jones is from Peckham in South London. She lives in a council flat with her family and for 20 years she had a room not quite big enough for two beds with her sister. Georgina's father died when she was 13. By her own admission, she went off the rails. Until then, she'd been doing well at school. And that year I'd lost my focus. was quite an angry child, so I started to get a bit disruptive in my classes. Um, and 
the teacher who was in charge of the kids sort of with more behavioural sort of issues. He took me under his wing and sort of um, mentored me in a way um, to sort of bring me, I don't know, back to normal sort of thing. Georgina wanted a better life for herself and her mum, a school dinner lady. Okay. She decided to aim for a top professional job. Chinese style chops. You got the chicken ready to go in here? No, I'm going to season it first. Okay. I knew that I wouldn't be able to do a job that I enjoyed or to earn the sort of salary that I wanted to, to earn to live a sort of more comfortable life, really, without having a degree. None of my mum's friends or family were university educated or were involved in any of the professions, so I think she was quite worried that that would be quite a big hurdle. What are you having with your child? I'm going to have chips and coleslaw. Chips are bad for you. We even have separate oil. She said it was a different world. <laughs> Growing up, she'd often um, say things sort of like that how the other half live, or it's a different world. All parents want the best for their children, but working class parents often really lack the know-how of how to support their children in m becoming socially mobile and moving into the professions. It's, it's quite a difficult and painful process. But Georgina did make it through. She got three A's and a B in her A-levels. Oxford turned her down, but she's now studying law at another of the top universities, Nottingham. Settling in there had its challenges. There are a whole host of psychological barriers for less privileged students who worry whether they'll fit in, who feel that, well, everyone in that organisation is white and they seem to be posh and they seem to be wealthier than I am. Is it really the sort of place that would accept me? I loved what I was studying, but it was quite hard socially. Most of my friends had been to private schools. Everybody's lives seemed so perfect and idyllic. All their parents had really nice jobs and everybody had done gap years. They'd travelled Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. The way people dressed at university was different, the way everybody spoke was different. They'd often say that I spoke a different language and thought I'd just listen to gangster music and quickly um, earned me nicknames like Gangster Princess and Peckham Girl. Friends would ask me if I had guns or if my boyfriends had guns, which is quite funny because I was studying law, so. Georgina's determination to succeed trapped her between two worlds and two groups of friends. When I'd come home, none of my friends were at university, so it was quite hard to fit back in. The guys would call me uni girl when I came home and sometimes they would respond to me as if I suddenly thought that I was more important whereas I didn't actually have that opinion at all. I was just doing what I wanted to do. But Georgina is on track for the life she wants, a career in commercial law. So go in and ask for our names and then they get Across London, Baharak Zagari is also aiming high. A hairdresser's daughter, she wants to be a banker. Shut up! She's 17 and on her way to get her AS results. Uh, mm. Oh my God, Baharak, well done! Are you proud of yourself? Yes, I didn't think I was going to get that. Right, Seen right. politics, all right, I'm happy with it. What did you get? I got all eight. <laughs> You've got very high marks in some of these as well, so mm -hmm. you will have a chance mm -hmm. of getting A star at A2 as well. Hopefully. Hopefully. In terms of my future, getting these grades means that I have a better opportunity to get into the right university, and with the university comes like a good career, because now it depends on not only if you got a degree, but what kind of degree you got and where you got it from, and grades really matter now more than ever. Baharak's aptitude for maths and economics make her a perfect candidate for a lucrative career in finance. But first, she'll have to break into the city. It is an intimidating prospect for a young girl with no contacts or role models. 
It claimed three in four city finance directors were privately educated. But Baharak is being helped by a scheme which offers an entry pass into this exclusive world. If you're from lower income backgrounds, you haven't had work experience, you haven't had mentoring, you haven't had all the sorts of things that you might have had if you were from a middle class family. And therefore, when you come out and you're trying to compete with those students from middle class families, it's very, very difficult for you. So we try to replicate the network of support that you might have if you were from a much more privileged background. The Social Mobility Foundation has arranged for Baharak and 11 other teenagers to spend a week at Barclays Global Headquarters to glimpse what their future could be. The scheme is about introducing them into the financial services world. But certainly having looked at some of their CVs, they're highly educated people. So really it is about trying to get rid of some of the fear factor. Hi, I'm Baharak to william Morris. I'm studying maths, politics, economics and biology. My name is Iqbal. Um, I go to Woodhouse College in Barnet. Um, I study maths, further maths, economics and literature. My name is Barry. Uh, I go to Woodhouse College also. And I thought it was in Finchley. <laughs> Apparently it's in Barnet. <laughs> <laughs> Each student gets a personal mentor for the week and a project to complete by the end of it. So this is our usual working space. Barclays are trying to improve access, but this scheme offers only 12 places a year in a company that employs 55,000 people. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to be getting involved with. No, it sounds it. And although Barclays took on 400 graduates this year, like most companies, they keep no record of the social background of the new recruits. We have a lot of statistics around areas such as gender, such as ethnicity. Socioeconomic background uh, is more complex. Um, trying to establish a definition that is universal um, and one that is not um, offensive is difficult. By the end of the week, Baharak looks at home in this new world. You're not focusing that much on channels or lending and that's because you've either audited it in the last two years or you've got something planned for it already. Yeah. Any questions? The demands today of jobs require skills much broader than pure academic excellence. For example, um, tenacity, creativity, uh, drive, communication skills. Many of the, what people sometimes term, the softer skills that are uh, a requisite uh, for success in jobs. All this soft skilling comes more easily to children from professional families. Baharak's applying to university this year. She'll be up against young people with parents who know the ropes when it comes to choosing the right place to study. We, we have a phrase, helicopter parent. It's a parent who hovers figuratively over their son or daughter, intervening like almost like a personal SWAT team whenever um, things get difficult. And they're incredibly effective. We, we, we define different types of helicopter parent. Uh, one was the banker, someone who, who, who will pay for their son or daughter to go to the university and expect a rate of return. Uh, the other I call the agent, and that's someone who would negotiate on behalf of their client who happens to be their son or daughter. A place at Liverpool is highly prized. It's one of the so-called Russell Group of 20 leading British universities the ones most likely to be favoured by employers. We know that many of the big companies, the big recruiters, you know, have, have increasingly small lists of universities from whom they pick p potential employees. Is that a myth or is that an actual fact that, that people who are recruiting for the professions look at these top universities? There are some signs that in the current recession that recruiters are actually shortening their university lists. So, you know, for this particular generation coming out of university now, it's an even bigger issue. Wolverhampton University is proud of its local roots and its record for attracting low-income students who might not normally consider higher education. And tonight, more than 200 of them are getting their degrees. 
This is a successful place, 30% oversubscribed and about halfway up the league table of Britain's 192 universities. To get here, a lot of these graduates probably had to overcome greater odds than their wealthier counterparts. I've come across uh, children from socio-economically a poorer background who've had to um, struggle every step of the way. Selena Maria Pesci. Those that come through that can actually be better equipped ultimately than those who perhaps had the easier journey, almost having things on a plate. This is a fantastic day for these young people, a successful end to 16 years of state education. The problem is degrees are not what they were. More and more students are going through ceremonies like this. And that means the top professions will look to the top universities. And Wolverhampton isn't one of them. But do employers just look at Russell Group universities and qualifications? If they do, then I'd suspect they're missing some very good candidates. But do they? There's a possibility that that still exists, and I'm sure it does. Um, but I hope day by day we're changing that with the many advocates that we have in our graduates. But some students we spoke to are having a hard time finding work. I've talked to a few fellow students, and some of them have been looking for jobs since last year and still haven't found anything. So it's kind of tough and frustrating, but we are kind of positive. If you've gone to like say Cambridge, I guess the people I'm up against have got you know that kind of standard you know of education that, that maybe they might think that somewhere like Wolverhampton doesn't have. But at the end of the day, it's what I can actually give to the job that I think should be accounted for, rather than what where you what school you went to really. At Liverpool, they now help students from less well-connected backgrounds to master the art of bagging a top job. That looks really sale. Jane? Hi. Hi. Would you like to come through? OK, thank you. We're, we're running courses, boot camps now, we call them, uh, for graduates. When we, we decipher the, the graduate job market for them, for the first time we started teaching students how to network uh, in business context. We have employers come in and talk about the, the hidden rules of networking. Um, where can you see yourself developing in the next five years? In the next five years, I'd like to enter the heritage industry. I also learned quite a lot from life experience, from work experience, and from uh, going travelling after university. I've brought up a family, mm -hmm. as well as doing a degree, so it was multitasking. These mock interviews are just one way to help graduates catch up on their competitors from more privileged backgrounds. Thirty-five percent of the interview is about how you come across and what you say. Yeah, you came across very, very well. The only area for development, I would say, is that your answers were a little long in pla and rambling in yeah. places. It's, it's knowing how to dress, it's knowing how to behave, knowing how to talk. The kind of small talk that you might have in an employer selection centre can all play a part uh, in, in, in graduate recruitment. And I think when employers are looking at, say, they've got 10,000 applicants for 15 jobs, uh, those aspects come into play far more than they would do in, the, in, in, in previous years. If talented candidates don't get an equal chance, it's business that loses out. Some employers are taking matters into their own hands. Allen & Overy is one of Britain's top five law firms. When I discovered that it's actually got harder for people from average or below average uh, income families to get into the professions than it was when I entered the law 30 years ago, I was just astonished and appalled by that. And so we operate this Smart Start scheme for over a hundred young people from some schools in some quite tough neighbourhoods all around London and we bring them in to the office for a week and we give them some really hands-on work experience. Okay everyone, welcome to Alan and Overy. It's great to have you all here. My name's Zara. And I'm These 20 teenagers have also come to learn the dark art of networking. They're part of a programme devised by the boss himself a comprehensive school boy. They work together in teams, they do challenges, they do mock trials, they do, they get, they do networking, they, they have lots of contact with uh, the world of work. If you can all stand up and go and find a flip chart, what is it that makes a good first impression? 
well dressed. And feel like not a slang, but like formal. Yeah, but courteous, polite. Be yeah. enthusiastic when you actually meet someone. Yes, so brilliant. Actually, a lot of these kids wouldn't even dream of walking through the doors of a building like this because it's a world that's so different from what they've been used to. Hi. Hi. The students are meeting a cross section of the firm's lawyers and managers for three minutes each. Um, it could be anything from drafting to kind of taking calls, conference calls, just speaking to clients. The fact that you work on a global level, does that mean you get to travel quite a bit as well? It depends on your client. So I have a lot of Middle East clients and I get to travel to Dubai and Abu Dhabi a reasonable amount. I mean, what have you enjoyed the most when you... It's the people really that make it for me. I, I really enjoy the people. And certainly around the magic circle firms, I think you're going to have to move on. Thank you very much. But yeah, I'd come to A&O if that's the most there's anything. <laughs> Just move to somewhere where there are people you haven't seen. Um, so what's your, what's your next step then? In your I'm hoping to go to university. I'm looking up Scottish universities though. I really like Edinburgh and St Andrews. We don't want to have a single gene pool, you know, of people from only one particular background. If every major firm had a structured work experience scheme um, which met certain standards, um, then I think that could have a really dramatic impact on the problem. So how do we change things? Well, a fairer system of work experience would make a big difference. But it'll come too late for Girish. He's leaving the country and heading for Mexico. As much as I do enjoy getting the bylines and getting great investigative stories in papers, London's not where I want to be for the next few years. I think I want to head abroad and head back uh, when the industry's hopefully a little bit nicer to me. Baharak's work experience at Barclays Bank should prove useful. This week has given me a kind of an edge because nowadays everyone's getting an A. If you've got an A, so what? Everyone's got an A. What makes you different? This will help me out in the future with career and with university. Any questions? But with university fees set to rocket to £9,000 a year in 2012 and no wealthy parents to help her, Baharak faces a mountain of debt when she starts her career. I like to work hard and I am someone who comes in very early and leaves very late. But Antonia's dedication hasn't been rewarded with paid work in the PR industry. Now she's looking for a job in publishing instead. Georgina shows if you have ability and you're determined, you can make it, whatever your background. She'll finish university in the summer and has already been offered a job starting at £35,000 a year at a top law firm in the city. It was huge, the building was massive and I just didn't realise that law firms could be so big. There was so much glass everywhere. It looked really posh. So I was really impressed straight away. I knew immediately this is where I want to be. Georgina and Baharak are on a path to professional success. But unequal opportunities stop too many from fulfilling their potential. And that harms all of us. Labour is king in the modern world. If you're not using everybody's labour to the maximum of their ability, that is bad for them, but it's also holding the country back. Research shows fairer countries prosper, so we all lose if the top talent gets locked out of the top jobs. That's the story of the last 30 years. People are trying to change things. How long, though, before we get a different answer to the question, who gets all the best jobs? Mm -hmm.